Hey, welcome back. Today, I'm not going to show my face. We'll see how that works. We are going to talk about apes, um, the unit one and two. There are seven units that will be on the test, so here we go. So remember that all ecosystems have living and non-living things. Biotic factors are those that are living. Um, predator and prey, right? The predator eats the prey for food. And so we're going to look at another uh, biotic relationship, and that is mutualism. And that is when they both benefit, like a bee and a flower. So check this video out real quick. It's basically sperm for plants. Most flowers make sugary nectar, too. They use it as bait to attract bees and other pollinators, which get coated in pollen along the way. And since bees are messy, they inadvertently scatter some of that pollen onto the female part of the next flower they visit. That's how most flowers have sex. All right, so the next form is commensalism. And all of this is just a review, but remember commensalism is where one animal benefits and the other is unaffected. So in this case, it's a shark and a remora. So watch this video right now. As an adult, by attaching to larger fish and even marine mammals like dugongs, the remora not only gets a free ride to save energy, but also a free meal. If it's stuck to a carnivore like a shark, after an attack, it'll gobble up the clouds of flesh. With its less aggro hosts, it probably intercepts parasites that fall off their skin. Things like tiny crustaceans called copepods. And the last relationship that we're going to talk about is parasitism. And you're familiar with this one. And that's where one is harmed and the other is helped. So if you have a weak stomach, look away for the next clip because it shows a kind of gross form of parasitism. Conculus metanensis. When they're just wee baby parasites, they attach themselves to water fleas, which is how they get a free ride into a human host. Over time, they grow, sometimes up to three feet long. Once they're ready, they'll start to burrow their way out. Disgusting and painful? Yes. Dangerous? Not necessarily. Ecosystems also contain abiotic factors and non-living things like the amount of sunlight and rainfall or precipitation and even soil types, which leads us to our next topic, which are biomes. And biomes aren't new to you. And so they're similar because of their temperature and their precipitation. Therefore, they have similar plants and animals and they're diff they have different sensitivities. So we impact them by building roads and having our livestock overgraze, by um, what we do with agriculture, uh, by erosion and desertification and eutrophication. So tropical rainforests are just one example, but go through the biomes with this video very quickly. start talking about energy relationships. Remember, all of the energy actually comes from the sun. There it is. All right. And so 100% of that energy, according to the 10% rule, is going to go into plants. And so you can see those heat rays coming down. All right. So I'm drawing a little plant for you right there. And you got to remember the roots. They're super important, right? And so there is a thousand kilocalories. And so we'll go through the 10% rule with an actual number. And that's just the energy available. And that is 100%. And so it's super efficient. Go plants. All right. And so whatever animal this may be, originally I was going to draw a cow, but it ends up looking like a horse. So it's okay. So anyhow, only 10% moves on through the food chain. So remember that they also have specific names. So that plant is a producer and the what would have been a cow 
is a primary consumer. And so if we're looking at the kilocal number or kilocalories, and then all you do is you move that decimal point one place to the left. And so that is an example of the 10% rule. All right, so there we go. We got that 10% rule on there now. And so we can see that that decimal was moved just one place to the left. All right, and so then we've got this lovely farmer and he is a secondary consumer and all that extra energy is going to go away as he, you can see that it's 1% in terms of kilocalories. And so if you remember, um, the energy pyramid, it starts just like a food chain lift. All right, so if you uh, stay with me as I finish up the food pyramid, I'm going to add a few more organisms for you to our food chain to now call it a food web. And so we have some sort of insect here that's going to also eat that plant. And it is also going to be a primary consumer and is also only going to receive 10% of the energy. And, and then that bug is eaten by a bird and All right, so the next term we have to go over is biodiversity. And remember that that's just the measurement of how many different organisms there are and how much of each. And we did that um, in a parking lot experiment. And so you can see that those are those terms, species richness. Um, so how many are there total? Um, it talks about the ones that are only there in that specific region. What's the genetic diversity within species? Uh, what kind of diversity is there just amongst all of it? And so there are a lot of ways that they look at it. So we're going to look at um, the rest of this image as well. If you take a moment and look at this, it just talks about the way that those numbers can go down. And there are a lot of ways, especially human caused or anthropogenic. And shout out to ecosystems because they can provide a lot for us, like food. <laughs> like a place to stay and recreation you know national parks state parks get outside stay indoors all right so now we're going to talk about islands and we know islands are unique and they are the victim to lots of invasive species so if you look at the graphic you can see that we're going to watch a quick video on the snakes of guam which we talked Down about tree before. snakes the snakes likely arrived on the island on a cargo ship or military aircraft in the 1950s and now outnumber people on Guam by 10 to 1. Every effort to eradicate the invasive species has so far failed. Vice News went on a night hunt with a biologist who's tracking down brown tree snakes one by one. It's estimated here on Guam that there's anywhere between one to two million snakes. Guam has no native snakes, so the native animals had no way to react to such a predator. Okay, so islands have a great climate, so people and animals alike like to exploit it, unfortunately, sometimes. And so Easter Island is another example of that, and there's more to it than that, but... Um, there, it's known by those statues. So you guys are going to watch a video about it and it kind of goes into what they believe happened in Easter Island. Early inhabitants cleared countless trees to build their society. Slash and burn agriculture, it could be very destructive. They were clearing larger and larger expanses of land, cutting down the forest to feed more people. Over the centuries, the population grew by the thousands. Harvested trees became canoes and shelters, but many were felled for the sake of one singular obsession. Building Moai. Nearly all of the massive statues were carved from the soft stone of a single quarry. 
the islanders considered each to embody the spirit of their ancestors. Some statues are over 30 feet tall and weigh more than 80 tons. These monoliths were moved from the quarry up to six miles across uneven terrain without the benefit of large animals or the wheel. It is believed that trees could have been used as posts for rope systems, or as rollers, or levers, to make sleds, or even as tracts that were laid across the island. Virtually all of these methods would have required that the trunks were frequently replaced. The moai are made larger and larger as the centuries pass. It seems like through time, uh, there was strong competition for not only building great monuments to honor the ancestors, but also in among chiefs uh, for prestige and status. Hundreds of statues still litter the hillside, many abandoned in the process of moving or being carved, frozen in time. One, known as El Gigante, the giant, would have stood over seven stories high. It suggests the islanders' ambition may have been greater than their resources. In the space of just a few centuries, the trees were used up. Okay, remember that in order for an organism to be the most fit, then they're going to have certain adaptations to allow them to survive longer, whether it's behavior or physical, like large ears, or maybe they sleep at night, or any of those things. And so it allows them to thrive. Specialized organisms have a harder time. So if they have a specific mating season or diet, then they are more likely to go extinct. So that's no good. All right, as you may or may not remember, primary productivity is basically just the measure of photosynthesis taking place. And this shows just on the continents and you can see it changes as the seasons change. Another thing you have to be reminded of is primary succession, and that's when no soil exists, and so through lichens and mosses, and uh, you eventually get to your climax community. Whereas secondary succession is when uh, some sort of natural disaster or event takes place, and the soil exists, and so it just has to take time. It takes time to reach that climax community. Mm. Just okay, so you all know about Goldilocks. What a great she wanted everything to be just right. And so she experimented with a few things. But with organisms, it is they need to be it needs to be just right or they die. And so we call that the zone of tolerance and that middle area is what we call um, the zone of tolerance and so it, it's just right and if it isn't just right then unfortunately you're going to see that not many organisms can survive especially of a specific species and so things like temperature remember the colder the temperature the more dissolved oxygen can exist and so that's super important to different types of trout and all kinds of different fish but I mean it can be the same thing like in soil with the pH and all that kind of stuff and so we have covered everything that I think we need to. You did cycles with Bozeman last week, and so um, finish the viewing guide, and I'll talk to you later. Have a great day. Bye.